John Bevyman made a memorable contribution to American literature the second half in the second half of the 20th century. I feel a tremendous kinship with him. My colleagues, at least some of my colleagues, call me eccentric. They say I am eccentric. John Bevyman was a brilliant eccentric. The difference is that while Bevyman was a brilliant eccentric, I am merely eccentric. Still, we belong to the same category. Bevyman was a difficult person to get along with. He married thrice and I think he divorced twice. Had he lived longer, perhaps he might have divorced thrice or even four times. I'm not sure whether that's possible. He had numerous affairs, almost all of which ended in failure and frustration. He had a lifelong alcohol abuse problem. He suffered from long bouts of intense mental depression. To top it off, he committed suicide at the age of 57. But here we are more concerned with Bevyman the poet than Bevyman the man. There is no doubt that Bevyman made a stellar contribution to the confessional movement. The Dream Songs of Bevyman is indeed a masterpiece and it brought him the Pulitzer Prize. The problem with Bevyman is that he was capable of writing remarkable poetry but he was also capable of writing very mediocre poetry. The ball poem is one of the most popular, most highly anthologized poems of John Bevyman. It is an iconic poem which deals with themes which are very dear to the heart of the poet. And these themes include childhood, loss, understanding, experience. As usual, we shall begin by focusing critical attention on the title of the poem, the ball poem. The title of the poem is nothing short of a stroke of genius. Any other poet would have titled the poem as a ball or the ball or the loss of a ball or the poem about a ball. John Bevyman displays his brilliance by selecting this rather unusual title for his poem, the ball poem. The title highlights the pivotal position occupied by the ball in the thematic structure of the poem. What is the ball? A ball is a solid or a hollow 
spherical or egg-shaped object that can be thrown, that can be kicked, that can be played with, and in the context of the poem, that can be lost. A ball is used in a sport, such as cricket, such as baseball, such as basketball. The ball poem, the title makes it very clear that the ball occupies a crucial position, a centrality in the thematic structure of the poem. The ball in the poem is much more than a mere ball. And you must remember that this poem is not merely about the loss of a ball. It's much more profound than that. The ball in the poem is a symbol for material positions. It's a symbol for everything that gives us pleasure, that gives us joy. For everything that can be lost. The narrative of the poem is not merely about a boy losing a ball, but about human life and how material positions are very much part of human life and how they will, they will inevitably be lost. Above all, by titling the poem, the ball poem, the poet put forwards the claim that this is the ultimate poem. It is not a ball poem, it is the ball poem. That the poem is the ultimate poem on the ball, which in turn symbolizes all material positions in life. So this is the ultimate poem on the relationship between life and loss. This is the ultimate poem on the epistemology of loss. That's what the poet says. Not merely the epistemology of loss, the ontology of loss as well. In brief, the poem under discussion has, has a brilliant title. The poet has provided the poem with a striking opening, with an arresting opening. The poem opens with the adumbration of a predicament. What is the boy now who has lost his ball? What, what is he to do? This is a situation which human beings have to face repeatedly in life. You are face to face with loss. Loss is an integral part of life. If there is life, there is loss. And ultimately, the life itself will be lost. The poet does not delay the introduction of the thematic, main thematic concern of the poem in any manner. Instead, as I said, he is very upfront with it. What is the boy now who has lost his ball? What, what is he to do? Please note that the word what is repeated three times in the first two lines. It serves to emphasize the intensity of the predicament faced by the boy, the intensity of the sorrow experienced by the boy, the intensity of the situation of loss in which the boy finds himself wrapped. I saw it go 
merrily bouncing down the street and then merrily over there it is in the water these lines capture effectively closely naturalistically what happens to the ball this is the crux of the thematic structure of the ball if this had not happened there would be now poem called the ball poem the ball goes bounces down the street and then falls into the water there are two things which i would like to observe here the first is there is something called murphy's law murphy's law says if something can go wrong it will if something can go wrong it will it would appear that the ball here the ball in the ball poem complies with murphy's law obeys murphy's law and bounces down the street and falls into the water the second thing i would like to point out is that the poet's shift from is that the poet takes care to shift from the past tense to the present tense the passage is in the past tense at least to begin with i saw it go but by the time the passage ends the passage has shifted gears from the past tense to the present tense there it is in the water the falling of the ball the bouncing of the ball the rolling of the ball down the street the falling of the ball into the water all took place in the past in the immediate past perhaps but in the past and now it's floating in the water that is in the present tense the past has led to the present the foundation of the thematic structure of the poem has been laid the ball rolls down the street bounces down the street and falls into the water now used to say oh there are other balls this line forcefully beautifully captures the human weakness for material possessions and the terrible consequences that human beings have to endure as a result of this universal or near universal weakness all religions teach us that material possessions are dangerous the pursuit of material possessions the gathering of material possessions the attachment to material possessions the obsession with material possessions ultimately leads only to pain agony and heartbreak yet the human being characteristically is fixated on material possessions the buddha declared desire is the root of all evil and jesus declared that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than 
for a rich man to go to heaven. Jesus also exclaimed, Behold the birds of the sky, behold the fowls of the air. They sow not, they reap not, and they gather not in barns. The Buddha and Jesus are examples of religious leaders who had nothing but contempt, who had nothing but contempt for material possessions. Every material possession will ultimately and inevitably be lost and the result is heartbreak. Thus, the pursuit of material possessions inevitably and ultimately leads to heartbreak. Thus, the poet first presents the ontology of the loss of the ball and then explains its ramifications. First, the poet describes in detail, graphically, naturalistically, how the ball rolls down happily, bounces down happily and falls into the water. Then he declares that it is no point, there is no point in saying that there are other balls. Thus, the poet tries to drive home the immensity of the loss, the fact that the loss is a permanent one, is an eternal one, and that nothing can ever erase that loss. Why does the poet say that there is no point in saying that there are other balls? This particular ball belonged to the boy, belonged to the boy. He loved it. He prayed with it. He prized it. It was his prized possession. It was his treasured possession. And the ball has associations, memories, experiences embedded in it. Embedded in it. The boy has invested tremendous emotion in the ball and even if you give the boy a ball of gold, that ball of gold cannot succeed in replacing this particular ball in which the boy has invested tremendous emotion, tremendous attachment, tremendous memory. Nothing in the world can for the boy take the place of the ball. This precisely, precisely is the problem with possessions. We love our possessions so much that we start thinking that they are more valuable than we ourselves are. And we come to the conclusion that nothing in this world can be a replacement for these treasured possessions, these prized possessions of ours. Thus the poet first presents the ontology of loss and then amplifies on its ramifications. Through the next three lines, or perhaps the next three and a half lines, the poet presents 
a graphic picture, a vivid picture of how the grief overtakes the boy. The boy stands rigid on the banks of the water at the harbour. He's trembling with grief, a shaking grief and he stares down the water where the ball went and it is as if his entire childhood went with the ball into the water. It may seem absurd to an adult that the boy should sorrow so much, grieve so much, agonize so much over the loss of a ball. But the value of a possession is something highly subjective. It is known only to the owner, to the person who possesses the object. From the perspectives, from the perspectives of the owner, the possession is prized, the possession is valuable, and the possession cannot ever be replaced. So the boy feels as if he has lost his ball, not merely lost his ball, but also lost his childhood as well. All the memories, all the emotions, all the experiences invested by the boy in the ball, go along with the ball into the water, disappear once and for all. I would not intrude on him now. This half a line is crucial. It captures the attitude of the speaker. The speaker is a witness to the entire drama of the boy playing with the ball and losing the ball. But the speaker now says, that he would not intrude, he would not force himself on the boy now. One might expect the speaker, the poet, as a sensitive witness to the drama, as a sensitive bystander, to involve himself in the drama, to force himself on the boy, to explain what has happened to the boy, to console the boy, to offer words of solace to the boy, and perhaps also gift a new ball to the boy. But the speaker refuses to do all these things. He says that he would not intrude himself on the boy. A dime, another ball, is worthless. A dime is a ten-cent coin. You have the idiom, a dime a dozen, something very common and something of no particular value. YouTube channels are now a dime a dozen. Well, the poet says, the ball costs only a dime. If you give a dime, you get another ball. But for the boy, it is worthless. A dime, another ball, can be bought for a dime. But that cannot end the sense of terrible loss that is haunting the boy. Because as I said, it is this particular ball that is full of meaning, full of value, full of memory, full of emotion to the boy. And another ball can never ever take its place. Now he senses first responsibility in a world of possessions. 
this loss of a ball is not a very minor event in the life of the boy. It is the first significant loss that the boy has undergone. The poet says that the loss of the ball and the unbearable sorrow that overtakes him, the unbearable grief that overwhelms him on his losing the ball, have taught him one of his first lessons in life. He senses his first responsibility in a world of possessions. The world of possessions teaches you the significance of responsibility. To have possessions is to be responsible for them. And the more the possessions you have, the more your responsibilities will be. People will take balls Balls will be lost always and no one buys a ball back. The poet explains the various ways in which the ball can cease to belong to the owner. People will take balls. What can you do? If an adult walks to a child, walks to a little boy, and takes his ball away. All that that the little boy can do is to cry. People will take balls. Balls will be lost always, little boy. That is a problem with balls. They will always be lost. And you must remember that you don't like your ball, you cannot take it to the shop from which you bought it and ask it to be taken back because nobody takes a ball back. In just three, not even three, maybe two and a half, short lines, the poet paints a brilliant picture of the complexities of position, of the difficulties of position. To possess means to lose or almost means to lose. It is only if you possess something that you lose it. If you don't possess anything, you cannot lose anything. That is why all religions teach you to minimize possessions, to have absolutely no possessions if possible. What happens if you have a ball? People will take balls. Balls will be lost always. Every possession carries within its heart the potential to be lost. To have a possession means to run the risk of losing it, always to run the risk of losing it. And nobody takes a ball back. What does the poet try to convey? You need money in order to acquire possessions. But beyond the point, money is useless. Money cannot do anything. For example, you cannot sell your ball back to the shop from which you bought it. That is the problem with money. Money is very powerful, but money has its own limitations. Money is external. Using just three words, three very ordinary words, the poet delineates 
the economics of money and also the philosophy of money in a striking manner. Money is external. Money is required to acquire positions. But beyond that, money cannot do anything. Money is not part of the world of positions. You cannot acquire positions except through money. But if you give your positions back, you will not get your money back. Money is external. He is learning well behind his desperate eyes the epistemology of loss. What a beautiful passage. The boy is sad that he has lost his ball. It is not merely sadness which envelops him. It is despair as well. It is a sense of helplessness. And this despair, this helplessness, this sorrow is visible in his eyes. But behind his eyes, the boy is learning the epistemology of loss. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge, the discipline of knowledge. On one level, on the surface level, the boy undergoes a tremendous sorrow, experiences an overwhelming sense of helplessness, is overcome by despair. But on another level, on a deeper level, the boy understands, learns, absorbs the epistemology or flaws. Epistemology, as I said, is the theory of knowledge, the discipline which deals with knowledge, awareness, understanding. We can try to set up a contrast between epistemology and ontology. Ontology deals with facts, reality. What is actuality? Epistemology deals with our awareness of the facts, of the actuality, of the reality. Early in the poem, the poet gave a graphic description of how the ball merrily bounced and down and fell into the water. The lines gave us the ontology of the incident, the ontology which is the final basis of the entire poem. But ontology by itself is not enough. Epistemology is needed. What is, what exists, has to be understood, has to be absorbed, has to be evaluated, has to be comprehended. That is where epistemology comes. The poem began with the ontology of the loss of the ball. And now the poem has arrived at the epistemology of the loss of the ball. How the boy understands what has happened. 
how the boy evaluates it, how the boy assesses it, how the boy comprehends it, how he internalizes it. Every human being has at some point or the other to come to grips with loss. To live is to experience loss. And the protagonist in this poem has received an opportunity to grapple with loss, with the nature of loss, to understand what loss means at a very early age, which is indeed fortunate. The boy learns how to stand up. This is a very important lesson in life or life. How to stand up. This is a lesson which every man has to learn at some point or the other in his life and which is often learnt repeatedly by men how to stand up, to come face to face with loss, to comprehend it, to understand its ontology, to understand its epistemology, to internalize it, to grapple with it, to come to grips with it, to live with it, to adopt the appropriate attitude towards it, to take it in your stride. This is what the boy is now learning, how to stand up. The poet informs us that gradually light returns to the street. Perhaps this could be interpreted in a very literal manner. It's late evening and the street lights have started burning. It can also be interpreted metaphorically because the boy has now attained a tremendous awareness regarding loss, which is an integral part of life. The boy has now overcome his intense sorrow, his desperate grief, he has learned how to stand up. He is no longer the puppet in the hands of the overwhelming helplessness that overcame him. The light returning to the street is symbolic of the tremendous new awareness that the boy has achieved. So on one plane the passage can be interpreted in a literal manner and we can say that the lights have started burning, the street lights have started burning and light has returned to the streets. On another plane, the boy has achieved a new awareness and so he looks at the world around him, including the street, from a very different perspective. He has a very different vision now and so, in that sense also, 
the light has returned to the street. Your whistle blows, the ball is out of sight. The whistle could be a police whistle, indicating that night has fallen and the police have started patrolling the streets. The ball is out of sight. It is completely dark and the ball which fell into the water cannot be seen. Or it could be that the boy himself has started whistling. Whistling is a kind of relaxation. The boy has learned how to cope with the loss, has understood how to stand up, as the poet puts it, how to internalize the loss and come to terms with it. And so he whistles. The ball is out of sight because it is completely dark. Night has fallen. And also because it no longer, the ball is no longer the obsession that it had been for the boy. Some time back, the boy has been, at least to some extent, overcome. The obsession, his obsession with the loss, the boy has been, at least to some extent, able to overcome the despair, the helplessness, the helplessness, the absolute sense of loss that he, that he experienced. So the ball becoming invisible can be interpreted on a physical plane. The ball cannot be seen because it is now night, it is now dark, and also on a psychological plane. The ball cannot be seen because the boy has been able to overcome the overwhelming sense of loss that he felt when he lost the ball. Soon part of me will explore the deep and dark floor of the harbour. We now come to the very last part of the poem and John Beviman gives the thematic trajectory of the poem a characteristic twist. Another poet, a lesser poet, might have concluded the poem with the boy coming to terms with the loss of his ball but not John Beviman. Here the poet says that the boy might have overcome his desperate sense of loss the boy might have come to terms with the loss of his ball, but not the speaker, not the poet. The poet will be, the speaker will be, or at least a part of the speaker will be exploring the dark floor of the harbour, searching for the ball. At least to some extent the ball has ceased to be, the loss of the ball has ceased to be, the obsession of its former owner, the obsession of the boy. But the speaker continues to be, 
concerned with it and he is mentally searching for the ball on the floor of the harbour. Perhaps this can be interpreted in psychological terms. The speaker is trying to understand the position which the ball now occupies, which the lost ball now occupies in the psychological makeup of the boy. The flower of the harbour could stand for the mental makeup of the boy, the mind of the boy, the psychological makeup of the boy. And the speaker is now trying to understand the position occupied by the lost ball in it. Now comes the striking generalization. I am everywhere. Part of the reason why we say this is a great poem is that the thematic trajectory of the poem begins with a particular and then moves to the general in a very unexpected manner. Starts with the individual, starts with the individual and moves to the universal in a manner in which only a very gifted poet like John Bevyman can shape. The speaker declares, I am everywhere. I am everywhere. The speaker is not merely, merely an individual. He is everywhere. That is why he was able to comprehend and empathize with the experience of the little boy. Now, though the boy has at least partially overcome his overwhelming sense of loss, the speaker continues to grapple with it. The speaker says, I am everywhere. You know, it is essential for a poet to have empathy, universal empathy, unless and until the poet is able to put himself in the shoes of his subject. He cannot write the poem effectively. I'm reminded of what Walt Whitman says in Song of Myself. I contain multitudes. I contain multitudes. I don't speak as an individual, but I speak for my generation, for my community, for my society, for my people. It can happen that I sometimes contra contradict myself, that there are contradictions in my voice, in my expression, but that precisely is because I contain multitudes. I suffer and move, my mind and my heart move with all that move me under the water or whistling. I am not a little boy. The speaker now tries to explain what he means by saying that he is everywhere. He amplifies on his striking universalist statement I am everywhere. 
I suffer and move. That is the problem with poets. They identify themselves too much, perhaps too much, with what they see. They suffer as much as the sufferer himself, the sufferers themselves, and sometimes even more than the sufferers themselves. That is why they are able to create such great poetry. And that is why they are also able to, I should add, ruin their own personal lives. I suffer and move. Not just I, my mind and my heart move with all that moves me, whatever emotionally affects me. I identify myself with that. I empathize completely with that. And I suffer along with that suffering individual, that suffering person. And that is why the poet says he, or at least a part of him, moves under the water. The boy may have forgotten the ball, at least to some extent, but the speaker is now with the ball under the water or whistling. The boy is whistling. He's trying to relax. He's trying to forget his overwhelming sorrow. He's trying to put an end abruptly to his state of absolute helplessness. But the poet continues to agonize, continues to experience the helpless, the hapless mental condition of the boy. I am not a little boy. The poet explains, I am not a little boy. I am an adult. I am not that little boy who loves the ball. I am not a little boy myself. I am an adult. I have experienced loss over and over again. The boy comes to terms with loss for the first time. Not so in my case. But I continue to obsess with the devastating experience of loss undergone by the boy. I would like to make an attempt to work out a connection between the closure of the poem, between the last few lines of the poem and the tragic and untimely death of the poet. John Beviman committed suicide at the age of 57 years. There is no doubt that he was overwhelmed by his own personal sorrows, griefs and heartbreaks. But I feel that even more than that, he was overwhelmed by the sorrows of this world. John Beviman was such a universalist soul, such a universalist soul and such a sensitive soul that he could not but accept, he could not but absorb, he could not but imbibe the sorrows, the griefs, the heartbreaks of everyone around him. Finally, the burden of sorrows became too much for him and he ended his life. The problem with Beviman was that he was everywhere and so he had to become someone who was nowhere. Let us scrutinize the stylistic component of the poem. The title, I've already spoken about the title, 
the poet has chosen a very appropriate and even more importantly a very innovative title for his poem the ball poem as i have already explained the title makes it clear that the poem is the ultimate poem is the final poem about about the ball and the ball in this case is a symbol for all material possessions i don't feel that the poet is the poet is making an extravagant claim because the ball poem is indeed the last word in poetry when it comes to the relationship between human beings and material possessions the poem is a free verse poem of 25 lines there is no rhyme scheme the lines do not submit themselves to scansion the linear length is more or less more or less uniform the diction is simple and everyday the tone is conversational though it is a free verse poem the poet makes use of the convention of capitalizing the opening letter of the opening word of every line this is an element borrowed by the poet from traditional verse let us take a look at the figures of speech used in the poem alliteration is the repetition of a consonant sound the poet makes use of alliteration when he says buys a ball back similarly assonance is the repetition of a vowel sound the poet makes use of assonance when he says he is learning well behind his desperate eyes anaphora is the repetition of a word or a set of words for generating a special effect the poet makes use of anaphora at the very opening of the poem in the first two lines or more exactly the first one and a half lines the word what is repeated three times what is the boy now who has lost his ball what what is he to do pathetic fallacy is the figure of speech in which the poet attributes human emotions human responses human thoughts to inanimate things we meet with pathetic fallacy rather early in the text of the poem in line 3 and also in line 4 the poet speaks of the ball mavily bouncing down the street and then mavily over as it falls into the water apostrophe occurs when the speaker turns to address somebody or something directly 
the poet makes use of apostrophe around the middle of the poem. I think it is in line 13 where the speaker directly apostrophizes the protagonist by saying balls will be lost always little boy Cisura is a pause near the middle of a line. The poet makes use of Cisura rather early in the poem. I think it is in line four when the poet says, when the poet says, Mevily over, there it is in the water. So there is a pause after Mevili over. Mevili over. Pause. There it is in the water. The poet makes use of Cisura again in the ninth line when he says his ball went. I would not intrude on him. I repeat, his ball went, pause, I would not intrude on him. Enjambment occurs when the poet ensures that meaning and momentum are carried forward beyond the end of a line into the next line or beyond the end of a stanza into the next stanza. In this particular poem, the poet repeatedly makes use of enjambment, where the meaning and momentum overflow from one line into the next. An early example is provided by lines two and three, I saw it go merrily bouncing or take the third last and the second last lines. My mind and my heart move with all that move me. A syndicate is the deliberate omission of a conjunction the deliberate absence of a conjunction. The poet makes use of a syndicate when he says a dime, another ball is worthless. The poem makes use of indelible imagery. The most important images are drawn from childhood, nature, and city life. The poem draws much of its strength, much of its richness from the profound symbolism that is woven into the fabric of the poem. Needless to say, the most important symbol in the poem is the ball. After all, it's the ball poem. On the one hand, the ball is very much a ball in a literal sense, made of rubber perhaps. But it is also a very powerful symbol. The ball symbolizes childhood. And the laws of the ball signals, in a way, the ending of the childhood of the protagonist. The little boy in the poem comes to terms with the laws of the ball incidentally becomes an adult. 
The ball stands for all material possessions. We live in a world which is highly materialistic, which is driven by consumerism. And this particular poem has special significance in the world of today. Perhaps it's even more significant today than at the time when John Bevyman penned it. The ball stands for material positions in general. And we cannot afford to forget that all religions speak against the excessive attachment to material possessions. Be it Christianity, be it Islam, be it mainstream Hinduism, all religions make it clear that there is an inherent immateriality in all material positions. That material positions are ultimately meaningless and it is these material positions which are inherently meaningless but which are excessively prized by us today that is symbolized by the ball. Finally, the ball can symbolize loss or at least the possibility of loss, the potential to be lost. The ball has within itself the potential to be lost just as any material possession has within itself the innate capacity to get lost and thus to break the heart of its owner. I think it would be extremely meaningful if we attempt to bring into conjunction the present poem, the ball poem of John Bevyman with a poem by the Irish poet Desmond Egan titled For John Bevyman. In For John Bevyman by Desmond Egan, the speaker contemplates the untimely death, the tragic death, the suicide of John Bevyman. <laughs> 